Thank you. That was a very nice introduction to controversies in thyroid eye disease. Dr. Roos will present um, some of these controversies to us. Okay, thank you for uh, staying to the end and thank you for having me. I have no conflict of interest, but the Canadian government did pay me to be an uh, advisor to their uh, drug review, uh, pricing review board a few years ago on orphan drugs, which may become relevant in, in a few minutes. Um, everything I'm about to say has just been published in uh, this uh, journal, so if you are tired and want to go to Napa Valley, please do, and my email address is there, and you can uh, write to me and I can send you the paper. But I thought I was going to try to keep this quite simple, because thyroid eye disease is complicated. And I was thinking, what would I want to know if I was sitting on my own trying to figure out how to look after somebody with thyroid eye disease? And so I thought, why don't we start with a patient, because that's usually a good place to start. So this is a typical consultation that might happen where I work in England. So the patient will say, look, A is really important to me. And the doctor will say, well, you know, let's focus on B, because that is really important. And then they'll ask, can we now talk about A? Well, you'll be pleased that B is under control. It's the most important. But A is what really matters to me. Well, don't worry about A. It's B that really matters. And what A is, is appearance and the social exclusion that comes with alteration of your face. And B is blindness and binocularity, which I've spent a lot of time learning about. And if you look in our, for instance, British Thyroid Foundation newsletter, you'll see patients writing in saying, look, I don't go out anymore because uh, you know, I, I feel uncomfortable. It's very depressing. And you don't have to take this from me. Let me introduce you to two of our patients in Cambridge. So this is Catherine, who is a London cellist, uh, very accomplished, who has also done some TV work. And this is her now. And as, it's kind of long, but as you can see, she writes to us, I think that if you've never experienced anything like this disease, the utter helplessness of seeing one's changed face in the mirror is difficult to understand. And here's another patient of ours. And she writes, it used to be that you couldn't take a bad photo of me, and now I hide from the camera. So actually, thyroid eye disease is a very serious disease, and it confers a mortality risk with a hazard ratio of about 2.71, so almost three. There are two good studies here from Denmark showing that. So <clears throat> when we have this consultation, you know, can I have A please and B is what matters, what's really happening is that we're, as ophthalmologists, we're really good at B, but we're, not all of us have been trained in A. And where I work, we're only allowed to treat people with functional problems, like here you can see this person has uh, epiphora and has had a lid procedure by one of my colleagues. And, they're all, they're, and generally we only treat when they're inactive so that the patient has to go through a period when they're disfigured before they can be treated. So what really, if you're going to look after patients with thyroid eye disease, my view is that you should make sure that you're trained to do the following. So here's something that Professor Douglas uh, uh, has done. He's taken an active patient, treated them with filler, and you can see that there's a marked improvement. I can't show you any of this work from England because we're not allowed to do this in our uh, public uh, single-payer health system, which I very much respect and support, by the way. And here's another case from our, our dear friend, Professor Goldberg, again, showing that you can treat an active patient and improve their cosmesis significantly. <clears throat> and here again, another example of a bilateral upper, upper eyelid retraction treated in the active phase. So really, what we should be saying is, when the patient says A is important, we should say, I hear you, and we should look after them. Because A and B are not mutually exclusive, but they're complementary, and they lead to holistic patient care, which is what we all want. And in a public payer system, we often, fortunately in England, neglect A. <coughs> and just to show how different our view is compared to our patients, we, I've been taught, and I think, you know, thyroid eye disease is a self-limiting condition but actually only 2% of patients consider themselves recovered at the end of their disease journey. And some of our colleagues have really started taking this on board. So I was taught, for instance, uh, during my residency that you know, first you address the orbit, then you address the muscles for strabismus, then you address the lids after that, and then possibly some fat debulking after that. And this is a recent study just showing that actually you should try to do as much of it as, as possible in one go because the patients are happier and they can do well. So what matters to patients, just to keep this you know, nice and straightforward, is their sense of self, which is violated by this disease. The next thing I was gonna tell you is how you can biochemically and therefore objectively assess clinical activity. This is something we've been doing in Cambridge for a long time. And we measure serial TSH receptor antibodies. The TSH receptor antibodies thought to be pathogenic in this disease. And what we've been able to show is that it correlates with clinical activity, it changes over time, it changes with treatment, it changes with smoking, 
It's affected by endocrine control, and if you manage it well, you will have better outcomes. So here's just an example. For instance, the clinical activity score is down at the bottom, and you can see that uh, along the y-axis, you've got the level of antibody, and there's a fairly clear correlation there. So it's a biomarker. And the little black bar there shows a period of tr treatment with, um, I think it was cyclosporin, and you can see that the uh, antibody drops precipitously. Here we're looking at people who are um, comparing smokers and non-smokers over time. People who, have, who smoke, their antibody is raised for longer. So this is, again, a helpful way of assessing activity. And if you treat somebody with surgical thyroidectomy, this is very small numbers, but you can see that the antibody drops off very quickly, this pathological antibody. And if you do radioablation and you forget to give the patient steroid to cover that, the antibody can, because of the release of antigen, you can have the antibody go haywire and have reactivation of disease. And so this provides a molecular underpinning for studies going back to, I think, here 2015, which showed that if you have a surgical thyroidectomy, it actually for Graves disease, not thyroid eye disease, then you actually reduce your risk of developing thyroid eye disease. And then finally, this also affects patient outcomes. This is a very busy slide, but basically there was a big national study on dysthyroid optic neuropathy throughout the United Kingdom. And we were able to compare their results with our local results in Cambridge, and basically we have a seven-fold reduction in orbital decompression in our unit. <clears throat> so how do you biochemically assess clinical activity? You basically measure this particular antibody, the TSI, you can call it whatever you want, TSH, uh, TRAB, uh, TSH receptor antibody, whatever you want, but if you measure that, it's helpful in guiding treatment. So which treatments work? And <clears throat> I think the, if you want to try to reduce decompression rates sevenfold, as I just explained, it's not one thing. Just like success with breast cancer over time hasn't been down to one single drug, it's been a combination, a cocktail. We do a couple of things. So we um, look for triggers. We use a number of different medications. We try to control the biome. We have very strict endocrine control. And we risk stratify. We, um, we, as I said, we treat the biome. We're careful with how we use radioactive iodine. We're careful with surgical thyroidectomy when we choose to do that. We make sure we have smoking cessation, you know, which is a very well-established trigger, as I showed you before, also bio biochemically. And we avoid certain other triggers, such as changes in immune state, such as after treatment with certain drugs. So basically, before you go down the sophisticated route that uh, uh, Diego Strianese was just telling us about, if you get the basics right, this disease will be easier to handle. So do all the basics. Get tight endocrine control first. Look after the patient well. And finally, is there a role for tepertumumab? Well, Tepertumumab, as we just heard uh, beautifully explained, is, uh, attenuates the crosstalk between the IGF-1 receptor and the TSH receptor. And that reduces the signaling and reduces uh, a number of things. I don't have access to the optic study data, the phase three study, but luckily uh, Professor Douglas presented it yesterday at ASOPERS and I snapped a few photos for you. And you can see that there is a marked reduction with treatment in proptosis. And you can see the muscles down here. Do I have a pointer? No, the muscles down on the. Uh, you, can use the you. you can use the mouse. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, no, it's not working. But anyhow, you uh -huh. can see that the muscles there in that uh, T1 uh, weighted MRI, they're much reduced after treatment. So this is a brilliant drug. And I think it'll have a really big impact on how we look after people with this disease. So, of course, there's a role for tepertumumab. However, there's always a but. A drug is only good if it actually ends up in a patient. So, depend. Tepertumumab is an orphan drug, and that's something that I've spent quite a lot of my career um, looking after here in The Lancet, the British Medical Journal, and, and other journals, together with my wife, whose picture there. She's a lawyer, and I'm a doctor, and we've combined that into, into this sort of enterprise. And basically, if tepertumumab stays on the shelf, it's not going to do anyone any good at all. So it all comes down to pricing and access, and whether it's something that is readily available. We heard about a very nice drug today, Vismodigib. Um, by Dr. Kahana, which again, in my country, isn't available, unfortunately, because of, because of purely for pricing reasons. So I, just to summarize, thyroid eye disease is serious. It can kill. We don't think of it as a fatal disease, but there's an increased risk of death. With current therapies, only a small minority of patients, something like 2%, feel that they're cured at the end of their journey or that they've recovered. There are lots of new assessments, and I would recommend that you try using serial TSH receptor antibody measurements. 
there are new therapies on the horizon coming out very soon, which can help, and particularly with difficult aspects of the disease, which we haven't been able to treat well before non-surgically, such as proptosis. But the clinical success of these therapies will depend on their price. There are lots of other therapies coming along, including small molecule inhibitors, which target a similar pathway, and they'll be coming out in the next decade or so. And most importantly, I think do not neglect the patient and the aesthetic aspect of this disease. So I just wanted to quickly thank my uh, first fellowship preceptor and co-author, uh, Rachna Murthy from Cambridge, who's done a lot of this work and given me the opportunity to write up, as well as our international colleagues uh, pictured here who've been very generous in sharing their expertise and teaching me about thyroid eye disease, which is actually very complicated. And uh, here, here's just a picture from uh, Cambridge, where I've done most of my training with uh, Professor Strianese over there as well, and uh, my wife down in the front, and, and a, whole, a whole bunch of good international colleagues. So uh, that was the end of that. Because I still have four minutes, and may I tell a quick anecdote? Or yeah. whatever you like. Yeah. So Cesar Mills, uh, Professor Freitag uh, for, uh, from uh, Mass Eye and Ear, was just telling us about the discovery of monoclonal antibodies. And that was actually done by uh, this Argentinian man called Cesar Milstein and George Kohler, who were working in Cambridge at something called the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, the Medical Research Council. It's a premier sort of research institute with nine Nobel Prizes, I think, at the moment. And when they discovered, or when they created these hybridomas to create monoclonal antibodies, they did something, or Cesar Milstein was a very forward-thinking man. He didn't patent it. If he had patented it, all these drugs would be giving revenue to the Medical Research Council in the UK, and it would be the wealthiest drug funder in the world. But instead, he decided not to patent it, and what's the result of that has been a bit like with Microsoft Windows, which was given open label. This was sort of the uh, MRC, LMB, and Cambridge's gift to the world, and that's partially why these drugs have just taken off globally.